Bio-Friendly Podcast. It's the Bio-Friendly Podcast. Howdy. Howdy. I see you're still, you've still got uh, your gigantic iPad. I do. It has not It has not left my hand. Not, not since you bought it. Not since I bought it. It just wow. stays in my hand all the time. You know, some people would say you should have that looked at. I should. Yeah. I should. I, would, I'm, I wouldn't say that. You sh- don't I would dare never. say I such say, I think it looks great. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'm already, I'm already, I'm very excited because I will post on our, um, on our social media, but, uh, I have done, I remember the jellyfish blackout episode that we did about jellyfish overtaking thing. Well, one of our listeners and fans of the show, Kevin Brayman, we're going to give him a shout out. Kevin Brayman. We joked on the podcast about how jellyfish blackout sounded like a nineties indie band. Yeah. And I said, I want to design an album cover. Well, with this iPad, I did it. You did not. I did it. I designed a hand-drawn nineties garage band tape, you know, like, like cassette tape cover and I'm going to post it on the, on the panel screen. Did so. you, did you also record a, an album of songs? Uh, I'm working on it <laughs> <laughs> on this iPad. Ah, <laughs> wow. <Very good. laughs> no, but it's in my hand because we're welcoming a guest today. We are a bio friendly podcast. That's exciting. I know it is very exciting. Um, our guest today, which we welcome is Karen Stevenson. She is the author of foraging cookbook and she is a professional writer researcher, wild food educator, and chartered herbalist. Isn't that a cool, are those cool titles? Yes. Yes. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Karen. Thank you for the great welcome. Thank you guys. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So foraging cookbook. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you give us a, a little background on how, first of all, chartered herbalist is one yeah, of the that's coolest. That's fantastic. That's awesome. But I, I'll admit, I have no idea what that means. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, actually, it sounds perhaps a little bit more impressive than what it is because okay. legally, I cannot operate as an herbalist, as a clinician herbalist. Right. But I can do consultations. There you go. Uh, so there's the oh. difference, but I don't even want to do that. I took the course. I took the, I wanted the accreditation right. because it gives me by far more powerful knowledge to share with people when I do my plant walks, presentations, and maybe even today with you guys. Right. Yeah. Right. Good, good, good. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's like, that's the great thing about titles is they can sound cooler than they really are. That's a, you know what I mean? Like chartered yeah. herbalist, it just sounds cool. It doesn't matter what you do with it. It's just a cool thing to kind of throw out there. So we were, I was impressed by it. That's for sure. I'm still impressed. I'm still impressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but so the idea of finding, um, getting into this, how long ago did you begin kind of looking into the idea of foraging for food? Where, where did this journey begin? Well, I, years and years ago, when I was a teenager, it was, it was common to see primarily Italian women picking dandelions and chicory. So I always had some basic knowledge that wild food was edible. It wasn't until at some point I, it was probably two early 2000s. And as a writer, you're always looking for a topic that is fresh and it's different and it's new, has never been done before. And one autumn I'm driving and I'm looking at the sea of yellow goldenrod plant. And I thought, you know what? I bet you there's something up with this plant because it's everywhere. So the hardcore researcher in me went hard at work and went, Oh my gosh, this is food. This is medicine. This is powerful stuff. Wow. Yeah. And I thought, all right, here we go. I've got an angle. I've got a story. Let's go. And then that was the opening. That was the segue to, well, what's next? If this is, if this is good, what about that one? What about that one? And before I knew it, I was out there foraging and enjoying the abundance of free food that's out there. <laughs> That's so that's so how cool. basically it all got started. Yeah. Where was that? The golden rod that you saw? Where were you driving? Where wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, dep- I, yeah, where I live, I'm in Southern Ontario Okay. and it's everywhere. It's in my garden. It's along the roadsides. It's in fields. It's by the side of forests. Um, you cannot not see it uh, when it's, once it's in full bloom because the yellow flowers are so predominant. That's mm-hmm. awesome. That, that, that is so great. And then but just because I'm curious now, so what are the, uh, what are the health and medicinal benefits of a golden uh, rod? Yeah. It's really, it's really powerful for the urinary tract to keep your bladder healthy, your kidneys, 
Uh, that's what it targets mostly. Wow. And it the keeps flavonoid. Your golden. Pizza. Pizza. Yeah, it's called golden Ron for a reason. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's got the urinary health acts. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> but it's exceedingly powerful for, our, yeah, it's just great. It helps to keep our urinary tract uh, in tip-top shape. And, and of course, having said that, it's a diuretic, so you don't want to go drinking a cup of tea of that and then hitting the road unless you know where all the pit stops okay, are. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Good to know. A lot of our listeners are in their car they right were just, now. They had just, they had just right now pulled over. Made a cup of got golden a rod tea, of golden rod. And was like, I can't wait to get into this six-hour drive. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just saved uh, the life right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, um, but there's a couple of other really, really great uh, uses for it because when you take the root, the leaves, and the flowers, and you infuse them in organic apple cider vinegar, it gives you a health tonic that is second to none. It tastes amazing. I'll really? take a shot glass of that and put it into uh, you know eight ounces of water and drink it every day, or put it into your apple juice or or whatever juice. And it really helps to keep you healthy and to keep the immune system. And of course, all the minerals and vitamins in the organic apple cider vinegar. Sure. There's sure. a huge yeah. bonus. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the flowers make a really good oil um, when you infuse it in a good quality olive oil. And if you have uh, just minor sore muscles, it helps with that. And it makes a fabulous massage oil because... The first thing that happens when you get a massage and the oils go on, you get that instant feeling of it's cold, it's cold. Yeah, yeah. But the goldenrod oil goes on warm. Really? So, yeah, wow. yeah, it's really. It, I did a plant walk a couple of years ago, and and I thought it was actually a unique group of individuals who wanted the plant walk. It was uh, radiology students at University of Toronto. Really? And That's one fun. guy, and I told him, I said, "You've got to let me know if you do this." Because he said the one thing, of course, that people complain when they get an ultrasound is that jelly that they put on is so cold. Really? So he said when he graduates, he he wants to experiment with the extracts of the goldenrod flower to see if he can create a jelly that goes on and people are actually, hey, this is kind of cool. Like, like not cool, but this is warm. This is different. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <funny>. Literally <laughs> warm, but yeah. very cool application. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I said, hey, you ever managed to do that? Let me know. That's, that's awesome. That is yeah. awesome. That's, and that's just one Plant. I know that is one that is, we just in her, her book is called, it's like 75 is in the, in the title, right? It's like foraging cookbook, 70, 75 recipes. recipes. So, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of ground to cover, but before we do that, what exactly, I know it, the name implies what it is, but a plant walk, is that like a specific thing in the herb, herbology is that culture? You teach plants how to walk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them probably would listen to some of the people I know. Yeah, <laughs> right, better. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, no, it's when a group of people come together and I take them out and plant by plant as we walk through a forest, through a field, I explain to them everything I know about that one specific plant. Now, of course, living in these COVIDian times, the amount of people that uh, are allowed to gather together, that's really put a bit of a damper on it. But, um, but I mean, in all honesty, it's best to have only five to 10 people at a time to teach anyway, because then you can give right. them personalized attention. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's logical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's kind of working out in that regard. Is goldenrod, now, th- this might be a silly question, but so when you deal with something like this, obviously you're foraging, you find it on your own, but have people already caught on to things like goldenrod where you would go through a farmer's market per se, and somebody would have goldenrod and be like, I have gathered this to sell or, or, or use in these in, in recipes and whatnot. Has it gotten that far or have you not really seen that yet where people are starting to try to sell these things independently? Uh, it, no, not goldenrod. Nope. Not lambs, goldenrod. They're lambs quarters, which is huh? a plant. Yes. Purslane. Okay. Yes. And of course, fungi, uh, many different types of fungi. Sure. Sure. Interesting. That's so, fascinating. That is. So yeah. in all of your, in, in all of your time researching this, which, which of your, of your 75 recipes would you say is your favorite for flavor? And which one do you think is your favorite for health? Ooh. Ooh. Loaded question. Yeah. We're just, we only asked the tough heard, questions yeah. here on Bio Hard, hard for, hitting podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, in terms of eye candy, the mulberry mousse uh, recipe is one that I would definitely promote if anybody has access to mulberries. Uh, 
because not only does it look really nice, it tastes fabulous. And of course, mulberries upon themselves are loaded with uh, resveratrol, different flavonoids, uh, a multitude of vitamins. So yeah, I, I would have to say the mulberry mousse. Nice. Mulberry mousse. That sounds good. I think I've had some mulberry items in my life, I believe. Well, then you've had flavonoids, Jacob. I have. Yeah. There's <laughs> flavonoids and mulberries. Well, I just found that out right now. <laughs> yeah. At this, at this exact moment. So, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to break it to you. Flavonoids are in a lot of different flu, foods. Oh, so it's not, oh, really? it's not like, uh, you know, Hey, this is going to be the next powerhouse. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, flavonoids occur in many different plants, not just our wild ones, but our cultivated well, plants too. Yeah. Well, we're curious. I'm glad you told us that because we're in LA and in LA, LA, LA. you got to be ready to have the next big thing, you know, is kale for a while. Yeah. And so now I feel like we could at least start going like, there's a lot of flavonoids in this and, and we can start the next <laughs> LA food trend. It's, yeah. it's t- this is loaded with flavonoids. <laughs> it's just fun to say. It is. The flavonoids, they opened up for uh, <laughs> jellyfish for blackout. Jellyfish blackout. <laughs> <laughs> flavonoids. They, if you really want to sound impressive, you go, hey, well, those flavonoids are polyphen- uh, polyphenolic uh, molecules that contain carbon atoms and they're soluble in water. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh man, we got to memorize so the, that the People one. looking at you are just going to go, I don't know what you said, but I, I trust you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's good. When you have a, when you have a run of words that just make people fall down because they're just, yeah, they, yeah. they, they get dizzy. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> that's, that's what you're going for. So that's, that's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Basically they're just a group of phytonutrients that are plant chemicals that occur in almost all fruits and vegetables. Now there's a massive group, like, you know, it's sort of like, um, uh, it, uh, like the, the plant family and under that plant family are, hundreds of different plants. So it's kind of the same thing. You got the flavonoids and underneath that you got carotenoids, you've got all sorts. So I love it. Oh. I love it. You asked for two plants though. You did, you did. I also want to know which was your fair for health benefits. Health. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Curious about that one. For health, I would have to say, uh, lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters. It has been, I have studied that plant extensively and from all indication from the research that I have ascertained and I have, uh, memberships to scientific journals, worldwide because i have to in order to get the uh, scientific information on these plants sure and they it, it's in the kinopodium family which is the highest for nutrients of any plant family on this planet wow i've never even heard of it is it is it something that's only in certain regions of the world lamb's quarters no you would find it in the hills of la if you, you would were- Yep. And if no, you let's go. Now, if you can't, what you're going to do is go find some area that you can dig up that you're not going to get yourselves busted for. Right. <laughs> you, know, you don't want right. to get arrested. Don't get arrested. Um, but all you have to do is disturb the soil, and chances are it's going to grow. Wow. That's it. Just mm-hmm. disturb soil, and out it comes. Yeah. That's what, yeah. You see, because, okay, let's, okay, now that we're talking about lamb's quarters. Yes. Uh, this <laughs> one plant that has grown under optimum conditions will produce up to 160,000 seeds. One plant. Wow. So some of those seeds get eaten by the birds, of course, yeah. but what doesn't falls to the ground. Those seeds go into the earth and they are viable in the earth for up to 40 years. Wow. Oh my God. So they just stay there. And until conditions call them to grow, they just kind of stay there and have their own little party, I guess, down below. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as soon as the earth is disturbed, if the soil, if the, that soil has those seeds, they're going to grow. Wow. wow. And they're just so, everywhere. Yeah. Because this is, you'll never see disturbed soil that doesn't have some kind of green growth because part of the process of our planet's planet survival is you can't have just earth because then you're going to have erosion and you can't have that you, you know you don't want the topsoil blowing away so this is why the weeds grow to protect the soil so wow. lamb's quarters what's a well, well find a picture of lamb's quarters okay. and then let's put it up on the screen okay so that uh, people can see it's right yeah. that's that's, that's lamb's quarters that's right i'm it, putting up a graphic right now yeah because you have the right, that, you have the right color yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly oh is it got it matches just kind the of like it's, it's like green grass. yeah yeah <laughs> got but, it it it's in the uh one of its close relatives is quinoa. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Very yeah, there you go. That. There you go. Yeah. I've heard yeah. of that. We're from LA. Yeah. LA. <laughs> you get your quinoa with your flavonoids. Um <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So that I mean that's 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 fascinating. So what many I, people many people think lamb's quarters taste similar to spinach. I think there's a distinct difference between the two, but 
if you had to draw a line to, you know, what cultivated food does it resemble the most in terms of taste, it would be spinach. Gotcha. Okay. Good to know. Huh. Good to know. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems like a really a really fascinating topic and a good thing to to get into, just because every, no matter where you live, there's you know you've got some some kind of nature around you, whether it be desert nature or or you know mountain yeah. nature or whatever. Um, so it, it's knowing what's knowing what's around you and what you can grab and 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 use and and, and make food with is is pretty. It's a pretty cool and useful th- tool to have, you know. Oh, it's yeah. literally grab and go food. I, yeah. I've, I've, I mean, I've done, uh, of course, I'm an avid hiker. Yeah. And sometimes I'm out there, especially when I'm with one of my friends, uh, Colleen, and her and I were out there. And we will literally snack our way through our hike because we don't want to carry food with us. Yeah. It's, you know, it's added weight. And we'll just, oh, you know, there are some berries. We know what the berries are. We'll eat them. We'll, we'll snack on greens, whatever wild greens come our way. And because of the nutrient levels being so incredibly high, it sustains us for a really good hardcore hike and we're fine. Yeah. That's amazing. That is. That's, that, that's really cool. But okay. So now on the flip side of this, I suppose the, the danger is there's probably some stuff out there that if you eat it, you'll, you'll, you get sick, just get sick and. Well, I, I'm, you beat me to it. I was yeah. about to say this show needs a bear grills warning, right? It needs <laughs> like a, it needs like a, do not try this yeah. at home unless you have done your research and you've, unless ident- you've read the book, you've read the book and you've identified the plant and you know what you're going to eat. That's very important. So kids don't just start eating plants without knowing what you're about to eat. Right. Yeah, mission critical, because not only are you going to wish that your toilet reclines, it might even get worse, and you, you could end up in a merge. Oh. oh, yeah, make no mistake. There's some plants, that are, they're going to hit you so bad, you're going to be on there for quite a few hours just oh, begging right. that that toilet tank could move backwards, because you're going to be, you need to relax. Oh, my God, that's wow. the funniest thing I've heard in ages. I don't, I don't, like, this is probably a, a, a dangerous question to ask, but has, have you ever made a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, okay. I've never made a mistake, but I, I made a very daring move. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear that story. Well, um, three years ago, I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis in both my knees. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to hear that. No, no, no. My cartilage is almost back to 100%. Really? Oh, hey. I have, oh, no, no. I Number one. This you is are, a good story. Yeah. I, it's a very happily ever after. I'm a very stubborn individual. A good, good stubborn. Not a bad stubborn. A good stubborn. Great. Um, I know that arthritis, for the most part, is a nutritional deficiency that stems right back to your childhood. Okay. And uh, I mean, I love my parents. I always have. You know, they're hardcore British, so it was just your your vegetables were boiled to death, literally. So there was no nutrients left. Um, But so that that was basically what created this in the first place. However. Anything, according to all the research that I have read, and of course, what I learned when I was in herbalism school, is that when you have anything that's caused by a nutri- nutritional deficiency can be re- regrown, you could really? say. Okay. Um, and so I thought, yeah. well, now here's, here's, okay, I've learned this all in theory. Great. Now I got a guinea pig myself. <laughs> I nice. practice okay. on myself to see if this is true. And so, yeah, long story short, uh, my uh, cartilage is back to uh, almost 100%. I mean, it took many years to create this, so it's taking a few years to fix it, but I have full mobility. I am I am no pain. I'm really grateful. But That's incredible. I, thank you. It is. But when I first started doing my research, I read that poison ivy that was, um, is in homeopathic medicine to help with osteoarthritis. What? And I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute, poison ivy, this is, and I thought, okay, well, I know the birds like to eat the berries and they're, you know, it's not killing the birds. So um, I thought, all right, well, mind you, it's extracts of the poison ivy that they're taking to create this homeopathic medication. Right. Right. Now, I never took the medication, but you could say for giggles and boys and girls, adults, whoever's listening to this, you do not do this. I do this. You don't. Right. Ah! Right. (laughs) I went out there and I tried to eat some poison ivy. So, so how did you, how did you uh, get the, how did you prepare the poison ivy so that it didn't turn your mouth into a, an itchy mess? It's actually not bad. I really? quite enjoyed the flavor. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> this wow. is what I'm saying. Nobody, nobody who's right. listening to this. Ever Do not do eat poison ivy. Yeah. Because I already know that I don't have an adverse reaction to poison ivy. Uh, I have, you know, crawled in it to take different photographs of mushrooms growing. I don't have any reaction to it. It actually only affects, um, 
I think it's 30% of the population of us do not get affected by poison ivy. And I'm very grateful I'm in that 30%. Wow. Or, or, or it could be inverted, maybe 70%. But any, anyways, that's not neither here nor there. And But I never take that for granted because I always test myself with poison ivy at the beginning of every growing season because you never know. Something right. can change inside of you. And, yeah. and next thing you know, last year was good, but this year, uh-oh, I got a reaction. Right, uh, right. So yeah, I had no reaction. Now, mind you, I didn't take a plate full of it, of the stuff either, but uh, right. I was just kind of curious. And, um, but that's me. Nobody else do that ever. Please yes, never. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. And I mean, I think that's, that's important for our listeners to know that you are experienced in this, you know what you're doing, you know what your, your body was capable of handling. And, and again, for anybody interested, you know, first of all, definitely get Karen's book because I think this is a cool place to start. Cause I would imagine the recipes that you have in there are probably things and ingredients that are, that are, are safe. Of course. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because she chose those to share with the world because those are the ones you're just getting the insider view of Karen's journey on the Biofriendly podcast. Right. Basically. But a poison ivy salad is probably not in the book. Not a good, not in the book. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, do you want to some really, here's a, here's a really cool piece of, of, uh, of history about poison okay. ivy. All right. Okay. Now we've heard, we've heard in recent years about chemical warfare. Well, back in the 1700s here in Ontario, there were two main uh, First Nations. You had your Iroquois and you had your Ojibwe. Uh, and in, in particular, it was uh, the Wendat. And when they heard that the Iroquois were coming to uh, attack their, their area, what they would do is they'd go out there, they'd gather all the poison ivy that they could muster up. And, and it only worked in their favor, depending on the wind direction, by the way. So if the Iroquois were coming from the west and the winds, prevailing winds come from the west, uh, or no, no, the east, sorry. Anyways, they would set the poison ivy on fire. Hmm. So once you're breathing in the fumes of poison ivy, you're burning the lungs. Oh, wow. So it's a a good way to fight fight a battle. They thought so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think the Iroquois did, but <laughs> yeah, right, wow. right. Yeah. Wow. And I was reading this. I thought, oh my gosh. I thought chemical warfare was something you know, kind of like 1900s. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But they fa- figured out ways to do it with with plants on the earth uh, hundreds of years ago. That's well, I guess they they were the progenitors of <laughs> of chemical warfare. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What What do you think is the easiest out of your cookbook? Uh, like for our listeners who are able to just go outside and do something in their backyard or something that's very accessible for most people. What's, what's a recipe in there that's like entry level stuff. You know, for the most part, I think I would say probably out of the 75 recipes, I would say 60 of them easy are are, are entry level. Cool. Cool. That's great. And are, are most I wanted, with- yeah, when I was approached by the publisher, uh, Callisto Media, back in uh, early January, I, I was saying, I want something that's really simple because if you make, okay, you can make these fancy dishes, it, you know, it's absolutely amazing, but I don't want to be the, the goroping, you know, the galloping gourmet forager, you know, like right. I want people to be able to not be intimidated, not be um, scared off. And, and I would say probably making mixed greens, hummus, uh, or purslane egg cups, you know, or egg muffins. I think those two recipes in particular off the top of my head, they're so simple yeah. and, and they are so nutritious. That's mm. great. That's great. Mm. What, what you were going to also ask about her recipes? Uh, yeah, I was, it was a great question. It was actually, when I was thinking about all the questions I've ever asked in the history of the, of the Battle Friendly podcast, this yeah. was definitely the, the, the greatest question i had ever i've ever and found. it's gone i don't know what it is <laughs> <laughs> it, fell, it fell out of my head of it course fell. but it was gonna be great though. of course it was okay. gonna be it was gonna like it was gonna change all of earth yeah but never what i what i will ask that's, that's <laughs> the less thoughts just buzzing around right now it'll come back, yeah, yeah, it'll <laughs> come back. it's around there somewhere yeah. uh oh i think it was uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. No, See, this uh, is what we were talking about. We embrace, we embrace failure. it. Failure. One of our, no, <laughs> what? no. When, in one of our first podcasts, we had the phone just started ringing and we were like, you know what? There's nothing we can do. We'll just, so uh, we we'll just, just say, don't call it. Right we just, we call just pretended it. that we had live callers. And so that's, uh, Ouch. You know, 
<laughs> How many, the recipes. <laughs> yes. Are they? Are, are they? Uh, are, are are most <laughs> are are most of them with plants um, that you would find everywhere, or are there some that are that are regional or like with? with when, yes and no. Foraging book. Okay. Okay. So like, yes what percentage and no. could most people find? Yeah. Um, this was one of the concerns that uh, the editors at Callisto had because they had done their research before they even approached me. Yeah. And they found that the main complaint with foraging cookbooks uh, that are already out there, not all of them, but many of them, is that it's so regionalized that if somebody in LA were to pick up the book, they're going, why did I just spend 20 bucks on this? This has absolutely virtually nothing that grows around here. Right. Yeah. And so that was a concern for them because they, they wanted to make sure that the plants were pretty much um, available in not just continental United States and Canada, but also Alaska and Hawaii. So in came Karen, uh, the hardcore researcher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I spent probably the better part of an entire week researching uh, because they gave me how many plants and fungi and trees and you know roots and all that that they wanted. Right. And then I, uh, the USDA is a fabulous resource, a resource oh, cool. for uh, finding out where do plants grow. Yeah. So I chose plants that were, for the most part, available in most areas. Uh, of course, there are some that are more regionalized, like what you got, you're out in California, you've got salal berries. Um, I couldn't find a salal berry here if I tried. I don't even um, know what that is. I want to eat one. I do. Well, gosh, darn it, guys. Get out there. Get out there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, but apparently salal berries are, are quite popular in the Southwest uh, U.S. And so what I did when uh, a recipe was for a plant that was primarily in a certain area, I would have swap out with... Uh, or, you know, so if you don't, if you don't have salal berries available, what will work in its place are blueberries. Um, ah, great, great. Yeah. So that's what I did to make sure that almost every recipe could be used by anyone anywhere. Um, because if a certain plant was not available to them, then they could swap it out. Like if you have no lamb's quarters, swap it out with spinach. Okay. 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 Would you say that that berry that you mentioned, say it again, the one that's by Salal us? Salal berry. So, Salal. <laughs> Salal S berry. Yeah, S-A-L-A-L. -A -L. Okay, Salal berry. Would you say that's the rarest one in the book? In my opinion, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Where you're coming from in Canada, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, I feel kind of special now. We're where the Salal berries are at. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's I know there's even, I even used uh, a prickly pear, a cactus in a couple of recipes and uh, they really are tasty. So what's really unique is that these uh, cacti actually grow here in Ontario, Southern Ontario. Really? Oh, yeah. I know you think Canada cacti yeah. growing naturally. No. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here's something you guys probably don't know. So where these uh, cacti grow is uh, the, the, it's in the most southern part of, of Ontario, southwestern Ontario, Point Pelee. Okay. And uh, if you see the latitude of Point Pelee, it actually is in California. Really? That same latitude. Really? So, so you may what, consider us the Canada great white north... Down. But we're not that we're not that far north. When you look at the latitude, um, yeah, we're in Northern California. Wow, huh. that's amazing. Yeah, okay. it's cool. I'm looking over at a map in the distance, and I think I'm seeing exactly the spot. So it'll be the uh, <laughs> okay over by Michigan. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Down yeah. way at the bottom there. Oh, yeah, that dip day down in there. Yes, that's yeah. in the, the bottom of the Great Great Lakes there. Look Jacob. at that! How about that? Yeah, a little geography lesson. We're gonna for put us a today. little map right here, so yeah. you can see <laughs> where, where we're talking about. Okay. That's, a, that's a, wow. That's that's a, that's so funny. Yeah, it's it's it is funny when you look at uh, when when you look at maps. There was there was a what was it? It was a uh, Reno is farther west than Los Angeles. Really? Yeah. That's, it's, you know, the world isn't what you think it is. It's Just because the curves and the way that we print up maps. It's, the world's it's got curves, man. It's got curves. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Well, and we've got, yeah, we have our preconceived notions of like, you know, I'll go California. Wow. That's way down there in the Southwest. Yeah. yeah. It's way. And you look at a map going, no, wait a minute. I'm standing on the same latitude <laughs> as Northern California. That's Northern California. Oh. Yes. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask before we wrap things up, I wanted to see if, 
Um, if somebody wanted to get into foraging, what do you recommend the steps that they take for when it comes to foraging for food? Obviously, get your book. I mean, that goes without. Well, the, forge, the foraging cookbook is sort of like what you would call an add-on because <laughs> uh, I mean, that's once you know the plants. Yeah, um, right. But I would highly recommend, first of all, go to my website, okay. ediblewildfood.com. Ediblewildfood.com. We will link it um, with this episode, so you can check that in the bottom. Thank and you. And go on. Yeah, and uh, and actually what I am self-printing, I am hoping to have this all finished at the printers by Monday morning, is a pictorial guide uh, to the 40 most common plants. Now, each and every plant I have chosen to be in this pictorial guide will, it, it, like I've checked it with the USDA, is in every state, every province uh, wow. across North America. And that's I think great. that's important because... I received some inspiration probably three, four years ago. I was just, you know, procrastinating as I, all these years, I guess, but I received an email from this guy and he said that he wanted to learn how to forage, but he is illiterate. Okay. Okay. And reading all this gobbledygook, you know, the plant looks like this, the leaves are this, the flowers are that. He says, I don't understand it. He says, I really need a pictorial guide. And I thought, wow, I never really thought of it, but you know, one thing leads to the other and the years go by. And what really has inspired me to do it now is all the news stories I keep hearing that, are, you know, like the New York Times are saying that it's not the coronavirus that's going to kill millions of people. It's going to be hunger. Wow. Hmm. And that's coming out of the New York Times. And the World Health Organization recently announced that there's going to be 130 million more people plunged into a hunger crisis uh, globally. And I thought nobody needs to be hungry. Nobody, if you learn these plants... um, they will help you survive. Yeah. So this is what really was the, 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 the poke I got to say, okay, Karen, enough is enough. We got to get something out there that's simple, that's fast. Uh, and it's, and I, I done the photography myself. So one thing I've made sure is that these pictures are crystal clear. Right. Right. And, and if there's a picture where you can't quite see the flower, then I've put an insert to the, to the actual photograph of the plant. So you can see the a close up of the photo of the, flower yeah so yeah um but that will be for sale on my website probably not until i guess uh early august at this point um but yeah it's learn yeah learn the plants learn what something is 100 percent without any doubt use not just my website use two or three different resources to verify before you go ahead and do it that's good advice that Absolutely. And that, that's a really, a really great point. Um, also about, about hunger, about, I mean, we, we, as a, as a society have, have, have come a little, we, we've become pretty dependent on the supporting cultures within our society. Right. So, yeah. so, you know, most people don't know what they're doing if they don't have their computer in their grocery store and their, or in this case, you know, a lot of, a lot of this hunger is going to be because of lack of money because yeah, people yeah. don't know how to get food if they can't just buy it at, Right. Exactly. And if, if, if the macaroni and cheese is all you can afford, if the can of beans is all you can afford, that's okay. But if you add to it right. some right. wild greens that going. you have identified with 100% certainty and you know that those are safe to consume, you are going to boost the nutrition and heck, there's so many wild greens out there. You can have a different flavor can of beans every day, Yeah, but, awesome. it, it, but it can help you. Yeah. 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 And you're, and you're getting a nice mix of, of, uh, of nit- uh, vitamins, nutrients, flavonoids. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm excited about this. This is one of those episodes. Sometimes the, we have these podcasts that really are terrible. No, they're bad. They're <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, Nobody wants to listen. No, to but this is, a, this is one of those ones that really strikes you. And, and, and I, you know, like I'm an avid. Oh, you're talking about this one. Yeah. This yeah, one. No, this is a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get struck by this feeling of like, Oh, this is important to me. And I want to do more of this. I'm an avid camper. My family, we love going on hikes. We love being in the nature. And so immediately I'm like, I want to learn the plants. I want to know. Cause I, you know, I mentioned Bear Grylls earlier. I love watching his show where he's out there in the woods and he's like, you see this right here to give you lots of protein. <laughs> you know, he's got, yeah. he's got, he's like eating something out of a branch. And I'm like, man, I would love to have the knowledge and wherewithal to know that if I was in the wild, what would be things that I could eat safely, safely, not, yeah. not, not, not risking my life. And then also, poison oak, dude. yeah, poison oak, poison oak. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'll just burn that. I'll just burn that in the campfire. I'll give everybody a nice, <laughs> Malungs. Yeah, Malungs. Well, but, if uh, I could interject here, speaking yeah. about plant safety and Bear Grylls, Bear Grylls being British, I'm going to yeah. mention something from the uh, the British SAS. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of their, um, he was a former SAS member, Lofty Wiseman, and he wrote the SAS survival manual. And I, I think it's in that manual. He has something which is called the universal edibility test. Oh. <gasps> and this you know is this? something that I totally recommend everyone follow to the letter, specifically if you have any food or allergy sensitivities. Because okay. you just because I've said today, yeah, lamb's quarters is safe to eat, doesn't mean that you're not going to have a reaction to it. True. Right. So there's a whole protocol, like where you, you, you squeeze the leaf and get some of the juice going, you rub it on your forearm to, and you have to wait some uh, period of time to make sure that you don't have a reaction because your Uh forearm is where you're going to show, uh, first, if you have a reaction. So I would really, really stress underline size 20 font bold, you name it, check out the universal edibility test. And please, if you're brand new to this, exercise that with every brand new plant that you uh, want to try to eat that you've deemed safe. Because just because it's safe doesn't mean it's going to be safe specifically for you. That is a great point. That is a perfect way to summarize this whole thing, which is this is something that we want to share, educate the world. But again, you've got to know what your body can take on and what you can do. And that's and, and these are the safety things that we recommend for all of you guys. So it's fun. The, the, it, there's free food out there. It's yeah. highly nutritious. We want it to be something that benefits us and not something that throws you on the toilet and, you know, wishing yeah. that the toilet reclines. <laughs> yeah. It's still so funny to me. Well, uh, that's basically, I mean, I, we although we're going to have the guy with the rec- reclining toilets on next week. Yeah. Next week. The reclining <laughs> toilets. Cause we like to pair our guests. <laughs> right. right. We like follow up in case somebody went out and ate a plant, but yeah. uh, sent them in the, yeah. them in the wrong way. <laughs> but um, is there anything that uh, you'd like to cover? before we wrap things up any any specific things you'd like to uh mention be safe be when safe. you're at their, be yeah when you're at their foraging it isn't just a matter of knowing what plant is safe to eat be aware of your surrounding are there bears in the area be prepared have your bear bells uh know the terrain dress for the occasion if you're in tick territory protect yourself from those nasty ticks they are out there depending on what specific you know what geographical area you're at sure um lyme disease is is a serious serious what i call pandemic people are suffering all over canada and the united states mm-hmm. um protect yourself from the environment know your territory uh yeah and just be safe because it, i mean it's it's not a scary thing to do it's actually lots and lots of fun it's great yeah. exercise it's whoever you go with it you get to spend time with them time in nature it's one of the best things in my opinion you can do just be safe be safe be safe got it where can they get your cookbook Where's they the best place can to get go? it at it is available at of course amazon um <laughs> uh and i believe callisto media also has this at barnes and noble as well oh, as cool. indigo awesome and it's oh, called okay. the foraging cookbook yeah that's what they're looking for so google foraging cookbook uh check it out or bing we like to push bing go to bing. we're big bingers here <laughs> go to bing <laughs> use bing um but anyway it's been uh, i've forgotten and this is because i'm a terrible host karen what's your last name stevenson so, karen stevenson okay yes. so that's the author you're looking for folks karen, karen stevenson. stevenson thank you um, i thought for a minute the question came back <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, here it is. <laughs> well, anyway, before we wrap up our show, we always do our, our tags at the end. We do this uh, long list of little things that have, we add on to the end. You're welcome to, to stay and watch us fumble our way through it before we get out of here, if, you, if you'd like. Or you can hang up on us. Or you can hang up on us, whatever you prefer. <laughs> whatever you prefer. But, but thanks for coming on uh, the show, Karen Stevenson. You've been wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, that was, that oh, was thank great. you. And thank you for this opportunity. I really, truly appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. And my gift to you is when my pictorial guide has been printed, I'm going to need a physical address to okay. send each of yes. you a copy. Yes, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I really, really am. So I will get you the address and, and uh, really looking forward to seeing that. And make sure you check out all the links that we posted with this uh, podcast so you can check out what Karen's working on and, uh, and learn more about what you can do for foraging food. We've been your beacon of light in a gloomy environment. Featuring parasympathetic nerve activity. More than greater. Ca- oh, I messed it up already. Oh, I, I was, Featuring greater parasympathetic nerve activity. More than charismatic megafauna. Dolphins don't quit. Nature is perfect. Look at eggs. And we are y'all inclusive.
And I want to add this one. Yeah. Now with flavonoids. Ah, oh, <laughs> maybe we do flavonoids need a place. Yeah, flavonoids yeah. need a place. Like, like, like it's the extra ingredient. flavonoids. It's not just a band. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Flavonoids has got to come in here somewhere. Yeah, we're, it's we're great. Gonna we're gonna there. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks again, Karen, and uh, have a good one. We'll see you next time on the Buyer Friendly Podcast. Oh. <laughs> Bye. Bye. It's the Bio-Friendly Podcast. It's the Bio-Friendly Podcast. 